Hi, everyone. I am, my name is David Newsnow, otherwise known as Gravity. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I want to give people five minutes to settle in, so I guess we've had that time now. So let's get started. Um, before we really get started, I just want to invite you all to interrupt me with questions as I go through. Please feel free. I'd really like to make this more of a discussion talk than anything, if possible. So without further ado, I'm going to present... With, with that in mind, uh, would anybody like to take, uh, take on passing around the mic? Swap mics? Well, that one does, that one has a cord on it, so. Uh, would, would anybody volunteer, please? Yep, all right, thanks. Okay. So, what I'm going to be presenting is at least a partial roadmap for what the X-Dry Force more or less has planned for, um, for Lenny. It's not a complete roadmap because we have a lot of little problems that I don't really feel are worth talking about right here. I'll sort of briefly mention some of them. But basically what I'm going to be focusing on is the configuration issue, which has really dogged us for a very long time. And I really think it's, it's important to focus on it because there's been a lot of uh, people coming to, coming to work on this project upstream um, in, the past, in the past few months and really years. So. Here's a basic outline for what I'll be telling you about today. Uh, just some basic background to the problem of, of configuration and things like that that we'll be dealing with. Um, certain basic aspects of configuration, problems that we've solved and problems that are ongoing to be solved. Um, configuration of output, input, and then miscellaneous other problems that we as a team are dealing with and have dealt with um, over the past several years that I'd like to briefly mention. So, oh no, okay. So you'll have to imagine that this doesn't extend beyond the screen. Um, so this is basically supposed to be a, a, a very simple diagram of our current setup for how we handle configuration. Many of you are probably familiar with the outer aspect of this, which is the fairly familiar dpackage reconfigure xserver-xorg, um, which will eventually, which will ask you a bunch of questions via dubconf and then spit out an xorg.conf. And the way this works is we basically have a single post install script um, that calls devconf several times to ask questions or fills in blanks during the regular install process. And it relies on several external programs in order to get information to fill in correct values, including discover, xres probe, and laptop detect. Um, discover is basically just a database full of um, PCI IDs that are matched to various device drivers. And for our purposes, it's X device drivers, obviously. If you see a certain PCI ID, you, it, it'll spit out, say, Intel driver to load. Okay. So it's fairly simple. It's maintained entirely externally to the X, to X and um, it's, a, it's a flat text file or XML text file, depending on which version of Discovery you're using. And that makes it easy to deal with. Um, the next one is XRes Probe, which is a script written by Daniel Stone to replace the venerable read EDID. And it's basically a shell script that um, it queries the monitor or the, the display panel to ask it for the resolutions and modes it can display. And then it basically spits all that back out to the, shell, to the post install. And then the post install uses it to fill in correct values for your xorg.com. And then finally, laptop detects a script that I think is fairly widely used in Debian. I believe Daniel wrote that as well. And it basically just guesses you have a laptop or not. And, we, and actually, xres probe uses that um, rather than the post install directly um, to determine how to, how to fill in the EDID values. Now, um, once the post install script has run, it basically passes, it, it passes a lot of these, the control off to dexconf. Dexconf is, it sits in, um, I believe, user s bin. And it, it basically is a, is a simple shell script written by Brandon Robinson that um, pulls the values for, that were filled in by the post install script in the dubconf database and spits out a xorg.conf in the end um, that's more or less complete. So there's certain good things about this setup and why we've kept it around for so long. We inherited this from Brandon and uh, some work done by Daniel and Ubuntu when we forked, the pa when we forked uh, their Xorg packages um, two years ago. And the nice thing about this is it's fairly easy to maintain in certain aspects of it. Um, it's mostly shell scripting, um, which is you know, a rapid, rapid language to prototype things in. And um, it's very Unixy. It relies on several different programs that can be individually maintained, dealt with, uploaded, and we've broken things up so that they work pretty well for the most part. Um, but there's several problems with this as well. One of them is that it's shell. No one on the team really likes shell, and to be honest, the post install script is kind of a monster. It's 2,000 lines of not fairly clean shell. There's a lot of hacks in there, and it's really not designed to do what it is doing currently. It's, it's really 
it's really hanging together by threads in a lot of ways. Um, so it's a little over-engineered. Um, additionally, Discover is a bit of a pain to deal with. It, it's, it's, it's not really a pain. It's very easy to update, but there's a lot of duplicate effort there. Um, there's several PCIDs lists that are out there, including the one we store in the X server itself and in the drivers. So the X server is aware of a great deal of this information that's in Discover. So it feels like a waste of effort. And in addition to that, there's also no one else besides the Debian and Debian derivative community that is using these programs. And I think even Nopix doesn't bother to use this. Uh, Red Hat and Red Hat derivatives, for example, use their um, hardware database called Kudzu or Kudzu. And um, I believe Nopix uses that as well. So we're not really leveraging that work in any sort of way to get this. To get this. We have to duplicate that effort, and it's really just kind of irritating. Um, the final problem with all this that's, that's probably the most important is that it's not dynamic at all. If you are to change some aspect of the configuration, say swap out a video card, swap in a video card, uh, change your monitor, you want to change your monitor resolution, you have to either edit this manually or rerun dpackage reconfigure x server x org. And that's just really irritating. Um, so what's a better method to do this? Well, this is the entire diagram, the x server. What if the x server was simply able to just do everything correctly the first time and dynamically reconfigure itself either at runtime in as many ways as we can make it do, or if it was able to just, you were able to reboot it and then it just detects everything properly. So this might seem a little fantastic given that we've dealt with xorg.com for a very long, or x386.com uh, config for a very long time. But in reality, um, this, is, this is going on right now. In the new X server, um, X server 1.3, and I believe some of this shipped in 1.2, certain aspects of this. Um, that is in Edge. At least the improved algorithm config, I think, shipped in 1.2. Um, there's been a lot of work done by upstream at x.org to, to address these sort of problems. Um, the, the Red Hat maintainer, primarily Adam Jackson, has written a, a great deal of code to improve auto config when you, when you completely lack an xorg.conf. Um, when you, when you, if you were to remove your xorg.conf right now from your et cetera directory, just get rid of it, your x server will probably run just as, much, just as well as you expect it. It'll do things pretty well. Um, and this is kind of surprising. Um, additionally, Keith has been demoing Rander 1.2, um, which I'll talk about a little bit as I get into the, the output um, stuff, which will improve um, display output um, configuration. And finally, there's been a lot of work going on by Daniel Stone, primarily upstream, um, on input hot plugging to improve the way we handle the input devices, and so we don't have to deal with all that. So this isn't really so, such an outlandish idea where the server just does everything. We don't have to have all these custom Debian um, scripts like X, X res probe um, to just handle all this stuff. So how are we going to actually implement this? Well, this kind of relies on having x.org, which you see here. Uh, according to encyclopedia.org, x.org was founded by per Professor Charles Xavier here. And but basically what's important about this is that this is completely different from X486 in a way. It's an open development structure. Um, I have commit access, and we can pretty much get commit access if we want it from anyone on the team if, if we really need to. And that allows us to actually contribute back all these patches. We don't have to have a massive patch stack that we keep just customized for Debian to do all this auto configuration. We can put it directly into the tree. Everyone in the Linux community will end up using it. We can draw from them whatever Fedora or, or SUSE decides to do, we draw from them as well. And it really pays off in a lot of ways. It's the kind of thing we expect to have, but in reality, we didn't have with X486. We, have this we used to have this massive patch stack that no, just no longer is present because of this, this, this change to the exit.org um, organization. So now knowing that that's basically the method that we're going to do, we're going to cooperate with upstream and push as much as we can and take as much as we can that's, that's available, here's the sort of details of what we're going to do. I'll be leading you through our xorg.conf that we wrote for etch. If you have an etch install, this, I'll be leading you through essentially what we did for it and telling you how we're going to get rid of each part. So for the basic configuration, I'll be talking about modules, the module section, the font section, and the DRI section. So the module section first, um, if you look in your xorg.conf, you probably have this. It's, um, it lists a set of modules loaded by the X server um, for various things, um, probably the most notable of which being DRI, but also GLX and things you really don't need to worry about. Um, so the way this works in server 1.2, which is what shipped with Etch, is that if you don't have this section at all, um, it loads a default set of modules. If you don't have an xorg.conf, at all, it will load all the modules in, that it can find. Um, but what we've done, what I've done, is 
basically I've said, okay, this is kind of irritating because the minute you um, specify a single module that you want to load that's different from the default list, you have to write out all the modules you have to load because it overrides the defaults. And that's really irritating. Um, you should be able to have just a minimal config file in that sense and, and just specify what you want. Additionally, there was no way to not load a default if you had, um, if, if you didn't have a section. If, if you wanted to say, I want to load all the defaults except for DRI in order to disable DRI, you couldn't do that. You would have to traditionally comment out the DRI, load DRI line and have all these still listed. So that's why we wrote all these out in the past. And that's, that's a lot of stuff and it's really not worth looking at because you probably don't care about most of these modules under the normal circumstances. So what I've done is I've implemented such in both the X server and unstable, and it might have transitioned to testing, I don't know, um, and also in, in git head and upstream, is that we, I took that default list of modules and it's loaded by default, and I've added a disabled directive so that you can just say disable DRI. And that's the only thing you, have, you can have in there, and it will load all that's defaults, and you can just disable DRI that way. So you can have your minimal config file, and it won't hurt you in terms of, um, in terms of this module section. So this is, exists today. We no longer write the section by default. If you do a dpackage reconfigure xserver-xorg, you'll just lose these 10 or so lines, and your, your um, config file will be smaller, easier to just glance at and figure out what's going on with it. So moving on to the file section. This one is particularly ugly. Um, this is where we, what we've done it does several things, but what we did for Etch was we, we specified the various font paths that um, for the core fonts, not all fonts, just the core fonts, which really you don't want to really be using, but the server requires at least one core font, what's known as fixed. And um, the reason we have this just massive load of junk is because when we transitioned to 7.0 in the modular series of, of the X server, we moved the fonts from user X11 lib dash, you know, X11 fonts to user share fonts, X11. And this caused a lot of problems for people because they had this old config file um, and they weren't finding the fonts where they should. We, we, we weren't able to sim blink it properly for whatever reason. So what we did was we just used said, thanks to Steve Langosek writing this really insane said line, and, uh, and, and altered all these and we write all these out basically so we explicitly look for them. Um, so this is really hideous, and it's, it's really not that interesting to look at. For most people, they don't care about the core fonts to begin with, and they don't care that you can modify them. You just want your server to work and boot up, and that's it. You know, you, you care about your, 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 true, your true tribe fonts or whatever. So, um, so what we've done, what I've done is, Eugene, well, okay, so this is based on work by Eugene Konev, who used to be in the team, he still is, but he's been sort of inactive, is that he wrote a patch to um, always use the, the compiled in font path. You can specify at compile time a font path and we do that for our packages. It's in Debian rules and we specify this, we specify this font path um, in, in Debian rules. So what I did was I've patched the X server both in unstable and upstream at x.org to always look in the default font path unless you set a new server flag that I added, say um, use default font path. That, fo that server flag is always set to true, but you can, you can disable looking in this if you want. If you're crazy and you really just have some insane reason to not look in this font path, you can do that. I haven't taken that away from you, but for the 99.9% .9 of the people who don't care about this, it will automatically do it and you can no longer break it by having another, adding on another font path, which is what it would traditionally do. The minute you would add some other font path, it would override the compiled in default. It no longer does that. So you can add in whatever font paths you want and it will no longer break your system. And this exists today. Again, if you depackage reconfigure xserver-xorg in unstable, you will, not have this, you will not have this gemish written and you will have a much cleaner xorg.com. Uh, the last basic thing is this little section about DRI. And this isn't really well documented and I really, I need to write the man, man page entry for this in, in the xorg.com man page. Um, but what this is, is for DRI, the direct rendering infrastructure, what basically allows your apps to talk directly and send, send commands directly to the hardware to do OpenGL fast and things like that. Um, it does so, the way the, apps, the applications do that is by talking through a specific device file. And they basically have to ask, ask the X server for permission. And once they get permission from the X server, um, the file gets change modded specifically for them. And what we did in Edge is, was, is we just, we didn't even give you the choice. This is probably what you want under most circumstances. And we just wrote this by default. What we've done is instead we've patched libdrm to use this mode um, 
by default, you can override it and set it to whatever you want if you'd like. If you have reasons being your sys administrator, you can change this. Um, but we patched it by default, so you no longer need these lines anymore. So that, again, will shrink your xorder.conf by a little bit. So right there, just already sitting in unstable, we've gotten rid of three individual sections that you know, existed in Edge, and we've shrunk down by about 25 lines or so, the default xorg.conf. And you can get this today if you depackage reconfigure. So moving on, which is to what's really the next task, is output stuff. Um, output being video, of course. And specifically, uh, the things I'll be talking about are driver selection and mode selection. So driver selection. So here's what we get. This is what we lean on that program Discover, the, the essentially PCI database that I talked about earlier. Um, this, is, this is what we use to, to select the proper video card, uh, to figure out what the video card is and load the right driver. Um, and this is, the, this is the section of your xorg.conf that does it. It's the device section. Uh, we give it a name, generic video card. It doesn't really matter. We can assign it a generic name however we want. Uh, we ask to Discover for the right driver to load, and we just fill that in. And we don't need a PCI bus necessarily, unless you've got multiple video cards. It's not even vaguely useful. But I'm using it as a sort of illustration for the process that by which this has to happen. Um, excuse me. Um, you, have to, you have to scan the PCI bus in order to, to find the video card anyway. The server actually does this internally. If you've ever looked at your um, xorg log file, you've probably seen it scan the PCI bus. So server, the server is already doing this every time it starts up, no matter what. The exact same th this thing that we do for Discover. The only difference is, by default, it won't, say, spit back out a module for you to load, or it won't just automatically load a module. So we've got a plan to fix this. And there is some auto configuration code that's been written by, by Adam Jackson to do this, it does it by the vendor ID of the PCI code, but it's not really ideal. Um, his plan, and something I've, I've talked with Keith about a little bit while I've been here, is um, to hopefully just have each driver keep a, a list in the symbol table of the PCI IDs that it's responsible for, and just have the X server loader query that and figure out, OK, I found this PCI ID. It matches this driver, just load it. And it should just do the right thing. So hopefully that will be implemented within the coming months, and we can just get rid of Discover and not worry about it. Um, I don't know if anything else in Debian is really using Discover the, the way the X server is, but we won't lean on it anymore, and the X server should just do the right thing. And this would allow you to just swap in and out a, a video card without changing your xorg.conf. It'll just work. Franz? What about uh, video cards that are supported by multiple drivers? Right, so something like NVIDIA, for example. Yeah, or the Visa driver, which can be used as an alternative for a lot of uh, specific drivers. The which, the which driver? The Visa. Oh, the Visa. Yeah. So we probably don't want to autoload Visa unless it's the fallback. It would be the fallback under most or FB dev, depending on the architecture. That's actually how we do things in the in the post install. Depending on the architecture, we would have FB dev be default, but under x86, we would have the uh, the Visa driver being the fallback. Um, but under most circumstances, we expect the driver to just work. Uh, if it says it can handle this PCID, we expect it to just do that. If you need to override it, you should be able to override it in your xorg.conf manually. Um, hopefully, there will be better front ends. And I, I, I don't have time to talk about it, but hopefully, there will be better front ends for altering drivers and things like that without having to manually edit your config file in the future. OK, so once we figured out the, um, the driver, we have to basically tell it how to output what it's going to output. Um, so we have a lot of ugliness here. And basically, this is how we do it. We've got a monitor section that we give a name to. This, we basically ask the monitor what its name is. Um, we specify DPMS option, which is uh, power management. This is enabled by default now in the X server, so we can just get rid of this option, period. Um, and we specify horizontal sync and the vertical refresh rate of the monitor. And the way we get these numbers in, in the post installs, we use that program X, um, X res probe. And it asks for these, this information for the monitor. Um, that's fine. Uh, the problem with this is, well, again, you can't, you can't dynamically reconfigure it. You'd have to change things. But the other problem is that the X server is already doing this. The X server can actually talk to the monitor and does talk to the monitor and gets all this information anyway. And it can handle this by default. Um, so if you, go, if you go further, the way this is uh, tied to um, specific resolutions is that we've got the screen section. And you can actually specify those here, too. But the way we do it is we, we give what's called the screen a name. 
Um, and we, we associate it with the device, in this case, uh, the generic video card that I showed you before, which was loading the i810 driver. Um, and we associate it with a monitor, which is this one up here. We give it a, a color depth, which we can just specify some default. And then what we've done in Etch is we say, OK, for each, there's, we go to these subsections. And for each um, color depth that you might want to use, we specify all the various resolutions that are available. And those, are, those come from XRES Probe as well. And we do this. This is, this is cut off here. But this is actually like, I don't know, 15, 20 lines, because it's three lines per, per item. Or I'm sorry, four lines per item. And we specify like eight color depths. Um, or six color depths or something, which is really just absurd. So you don't actually need to do this. You can just specify this modes in general for um, the single screen section and say, use this for all the different uh, color depths. And that's actually what I've done for Unstable recently. Uh, if you depackage reconfigure xserver-xorg, right now, all these will instead be put into one, one line here, and you'll get rid of about 20, 20 odd lines here as well. And your uh, xorg.conf will shrink dramatically. And you get all the same information. Now, the problem with that, though, that approach, is that this isn't necessarily even that useful, especially in the new world with what is known as Render 1.2, which you've probably seen Keith demoing, and actually what I'm demoing for you right here. Render 1. You have XRender um, no matter which, which version of Debian you're running right now, given that you're running something vaguely recent. Um, and it's basically the resize and rotate extension that allows you to change the resolution of the monitor on the fly. And what, what Render 1.2 does is it actually dynamically allows that for, for, um, for things like laptops and, and for outputting um, to external displays and things like that. So that improves even this. And it really relies on the changes that come with Render 1.2 really rely on having this information available from the monitor at the runtime. So the server is already querying this. So we can potentially get rid of it. And if you're running a Render 1.2 driver, which is currently i810 and NVIDIA, or Intel and NVIDIA in... Um, in unstable. Um, this is an ATI card. ATI, the driver isn't released yet, but hopefully it'll be coming soon uh, from upstream. But basically, all the major drivers will be taken care of. NVIDIA GLX doesn't support it yet either, but it, it's also forthcoming. Um, but basically, for all the major video cards, we should be, just be able to dump this information. Um, we may want to store it in a cache in case the monitor, for some reason, doesn't um, actually respond with the EDID information and all these resolutions. And some old monitors apparently don't do that. So we may want to cache that. And that's basically what we're using XRES uh, probe for now and all this information. So we should be able to get rid of it. And hopefully that will happen soon. It's basically, if I can figure out how to cache it properly, or if Adam Jackson does, um, we'll just get rid of it. And pretty much all of this can just go away at that point. So we can just dump it, and you don't have to worry about it, unless you have to set your resolution before you start the X server. Input. So, Franz? I have a monitor that supports uh, 1600 by 1200, but only does so as, uh, at, a, at a really horrible uh, refresh rate. Um, there is an option, I think, that you can set a target refresh rate that will be used uh, on boot of the DX server uh, so that it will use a lower mode that actually matches the higher refresh rate that you really want. Is that correct? I, I honestly don't know. That's a good question. Keith, Keith's nodding, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. <laughs> OK, so the other, the other real big thing that X deals with is input, obviously, um, mice and keyboards, really. And one of the things that we've tradition, one of the problems we traditionally faced um, is that the server isn't really aware of input hot plugging. It's basically, it, it really tries to configure um, the server at runtime. And the way we've hacked around this is to lean on the kernel very heavily. Uh, we let the kernel multiplex all information to uh, dev input mice, which is set up by udev. And that works really well. It does actually really work. People can, can plug and unplug their mice, and it, it works. Um, but we haven't, in Debian, sort of really relied on that for pointers. Um, so hopefully that will be forthcoming soon. But here's, here's what we have done in Etch. So this is, this is for the mouse and the pointer. And basically what we do is it's sort of similar. Uh, we give it an identifier. It's sort of similar to the device, or to the um, output. We give it an identifier, and we tell it what driver to load. In this case, mouse, which is, I, I can't imagine anyone who's not loading the mouse driver these days. 
Um, we tell it it's the core pointer, which is, of course, the, the most important pointer. It's, the X server needs at least one core pointer. It's the required one. And you can have that fail if you, if you explicitly specify it, but we don't. Uh, you tell it what device to look in, and we, by default, do dev input mice. And we tell it what protocol to use. The mice can speak several different protocols, including Explorer PS2, which you see here, or IMPS2, and all these different things. So what are we going to do to get rid of this? Well, we can just load the mouse by default, especially if, if, it, if it detects, um, if the X server detects a mouse um, via HAL. Uh, Daniel's been working on integrating HAL, um, in, in, um, the ability to speak to HAL via Dbus into the X server uh, upstream. And hopefully, when he gets the ability to do that, it'll, it'll arrive for us, and we'll, we'll put that in. Um, we may want to go instead th of through the mouse, um, through the EVDEV driver, EV uh, dev, which is written by our own Zephaniah Hull. Um, I'm not entirely sure how appropriate that is. I haven't tested it extensively. Some people have had real problems with it. It works, but it seems to be fairly complicated to have a generic device driver like EVDV, like EVDEV. So, but we can just tell it what's the core pointer, especially when there's only one de uh, pointer device detected. And we can also, by default, just point it at dev input mice, which is actually what the X server does when you don't have one of these sections. And it's really the right thing to do. Dev input mice really, it handles things properly, and most people should be running UDEV these days. I know some people really don't like it for pretty good reasons, but frankly, if you're one of those people, we're not going to take it away the ability to configure this sort of thing, but you're going to have to do the work for us. We're not going to do it for you in the, in the post install script anymore. Um, this makes our lives easier. It makes the lives of you easier for who don't care about using UDEV. And it's really the right thing to do. So we'll probably stop allowing you by default to do things like point at dev PSAUX in our own scripts. Um, finally, for the, the protocol, it turns out that the kernel driver for, for the mouse is really surprisingly good with the protocol. If you point, if you point the mouse driver at dev input mice, um, the kernel, what will what happen with the kernel driver is when it multiplexes the mice input to this, uh, this device, it automatically um, translates the protocol into like a superset of all the different protocols. And the mouse driver can handle this. So you don't have to specify the protocol. It'll just do the right thing. So today, if you want to delete this and you're pointing at dev input mice, you can. Uh, I haven't done that yet in the post install script. I need to. But that's something that, um, that can happen today. You can get rid of that. Keyboard. So keyboard is relatively, well, it's different to configure. So much like all the other sections, we give it a name, the identifier, in this case, generic keyboard. We tell it to load the KBD driver. Um, that, that might have broken for some of you recently who had the old keyboard driver, K-E-Y-B-O-A-R-D, and we didn't alias it properly to keyboard anymore, and that broke for some people. Uh, that, should be, that fix is, I don't think, quite ready yet, but I think it's forthcoming. Um, we tell it what's the core keyboard. And then there's certain unsolved problems here for us. We've discussed it, I've discussed it a little bit with Keith, but basically um, we, we have to specify X keyboard rules um, for which sort of key map you use, what's the layout, in this case, because I'm American, you use US, um, and then the XORG layout, or X, XKB rules. Um, it's not clear, entirely clear to me yet how to handle this. We might be able to, currently the way the, the post install script handles it is it takes information spit out by the Debian installer um, and uh, fills in these values, it sort of guesses the right values for you. I'm not sure how exactly to get this working in the server. Maybe by guessing from the locale is something we've talked about, and hopefully we can get that working at some point. So we can just scrap this whole section, and it'll work by default for you at runtime every time. Um, that's the ultimate goal, but I don't, have a, I don't have an answer for that yet. And if people would like to talk about how to do that, I'd really like to hear your input. And finally, this doesn't fall under input or output. This just kind of ties everything together. This is the server layout section. And you basically, you, all these different um, devices, including the mouse, the generic keyboard, the screen, the default layout, all get tied together with this section. And this basically tells the server, OK, use all these things I specified before, and that's, that's the configuration you want. It allows you to specify a ton of different alternate things and turn them on and off easily. But in reality, I don't think anyone's using this too much. Um, we're not going to take this away, but what we'll do is if you don't have one, um, it'll just choose the right values. It'll use everything that's available. It'll use the first one it finds with certain drivers, things like that. And it'll generally do the right thing. That code exists today in the x.org head, uh, in git head. It does not exist yet in, in Debian because I haven't, it's, it's kind of a pain to backport and it's not really worth it. So, but you will get this. It is forthcoming. I tested it. It works. And it will ship with Lenny. So this will just go away.
So that's that's it for the details on configuration. Are there are there any questions before I keep going with with the basic bugs that we've been doing, Keith? So how long will the default configuration file be now? How what? How how many lines? Hopefully very few. As far as I know, hopefully it'll be none in the end. Um, if we can get rid of that XKB stuff, it'll be nothing. That's all the sections right there. What I put up, and that's what we really want. Okay. So other long-standing bugs. So this is sort of getting into the broader team stuff, and I'd like to talk about what some of the, some of the stuff that the rest of the team is doing, rather than just my stuff. Um, and we've had several long-standing bugs that that were really problematic for the team as a whole. Uh, one really notable one, especially during the Sarge release, was that we were not up to date at all. We shipped X386 4.3 with Sarge. We all know that was a mistake. It, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I supported it at the time too, even though I wasn't really actively involved in the team at that point. But it was a problem. And now with the new upstream with X.org, we've really tried hard to stay up to date. We've tried to really push things back. We've tried to really stay involved with, with, with the community as a whole. And I think that's really important. Um, and lately, that work has really been done by Julian Christo, who unfortunately does not appear to be in the audience right now, even though he's around. And previously for 7.1 and a little bit lately is Drew Parsons, who is also our XPrint maintainer. Um, so we've been pretty good about staying up to date with Upstream. We've tried to get drivers to you guys quickly and rapidly, if only in experimental. But we have tried to do that. You guys have the latest stuff. And we really appreciate your feedback in order to push it back to x.org. Um, bug reports are something I've been very bad about. Brandon Robinson was extremely good about these. I've been terrible about them while I was really primarily the maintainer. Um, recently, Julian recruited uh, Bryce Goglin to, to Goglin to work on these. And he, if you haven't seen, is just been doing a phenomenal job. I've tried to um, I tried to get a graph of his bugs, but I wasn't able to get them. I had an old URL, unfortunately. But he's basically closed about a thousand bugs over the past several months and forwarded a ton upstream. So our bug, our BTS is actually now in good shape. You can browse it and get a fairly up to date information on what the package state is like across the entire Xorg pa Xorg package set. And um, you can expect to get a response pretty quick from him. He's been really good. And he's generally very bright and making very, very good calls on all the bugs. So Bryce has been doing a fantastic job as well. Um, more recently, something that people have been complaining about for a very long time has been the X applications. Um, traditionally, what we've done is we've bundled them up into X-based clients and I think X-utils. Um, including things you don't need, like XIs, and things you really do, like XINIT and StartX. So people have been begging us for, for, to split these things up for a very long time. Um, that actually happened in Ubuntu. Daniel Stone split everything. Each, each of these little tiny apps got their one individual package, because that's the way they're handled upstream. But I basically looked at that and said, no, this is a maintenance nightmare. I don't want to deal with it. So I bundled them all up again the same way they were in, in Sarge, and shipped them that way in Etch. But Timo Altonen, who um, I hope I vaguely pronounced that correctly, um, who's actually an Ubuntu guy, has come on and decided to sort of find a middle ground. And what he's done, and most of this I believe is an experimental now, is um, has, has split the packages into something following the Fedora model, where we've got some of the basic things you need to just run a server at all, like XINIT and StartX in one package. And then there's a lot of extra things, for example, in, in um, like XIs or, you know, in another or XCALC in another package uh, that you just don't need to install if you don't want those apps. So there's several of these packages. They're in experimental. And those are becoming available soon. And we'll hopefully be getting those into unstable as soon as me or Julian find the time to do it. So that's been a long-standing bug that um, people have been asking after that I'm happy to finally seeing, be seeing resolved. And it's nice to actually get a little bit of input from Ubuntu. We haven't had that since Daniel left. Things we could really use your help on. Um, and I think the project could really benefit from some of this stuff if we could get these, these specific things done. And some of these are very high profile. And basically, we don't either have the time to do them or we don't have the time to do them properly. And we'd really like someone who's really, really capable to do these. Or not even necessarily capable, but interested. And we can guide you through the process. Um, drivers, first and foremost. We'd really like to package the Nouveau driver. Um, I don't know if it's ready. I haven't evaluated it. Nouveau, for those of you who aren't aware, is a fork of the, the free software NVIDIA driver where they've reverse engineered the 3D, uh, the 3D portion of the chipset and implemented DRI for it. So you can actually run accelerated um, graphics on NVIDIA using this driver with a totally free driver. Um, it's not 
production ready by any means. According to the developers, it's still in development status. But we'd really like to get this into the archive. We'd really like to sh maybe ship this with Lenny. And I really want to support this project. And I don't have any NVIDIA hardware. I know there's plenty of people out there who do, who, ha who are running NVIDIA GLX. So I'd really like for them, if anyone is interested in maintaining this driver or working on this, it's not that hard. We'll guide you through the process. We'll, we'll sponsor you, and we'll help you out, provide you with Git repository, pretty much whatever you need. Um, so we'd really like your help. Just about a week ago, the Avivo driver was, was announced. And this is really exciting, because this is for new Radeons. The traditional ATI uh, driver only supports up to R300 for accelerated um, graphics. And it was pretty much broken for all things beyond that, including 2D as far as I know. Um, the Avivo driver implements support for newer Radeons, and it's still, it's not entirely ready, um, but it's in pretty good shape. People are running it. Um, and we, we have this packaged, and it's, it's uploaded. It's sitting in new right now. Julian packaged it. Um, but we'd, what we'd really like is if someone has a newer Radeon, and for example, you're running FGLRX, that you, you, if you're interested in maintaining this, please come talk to us. Um, there's a fairly large team upstream. There's a, a fa well, not large, but significant, and they're pretty good, and they know what they're doing, and they could really use your help, both in developing the driver, and we could use your help maintaining it for our users. Um, another high-profile set of packages that um, has gotten a lot of attention are Compies and Barrel. Is there anyone who are unaware of Compies or Barrel? OK, that's what I thought. It's, it's, it's hot, right? I mean, everyone. I mean. You know, this is the sort of thing people are using to sell Linux. And it's really, really hot. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Compies and Barrel are merging. Um, I don't know the state of that. I don't follow the projects. We do have a Compies maintainer, uh, Theory Redding. He's really technically outstanding. And he's done a very good job, but he's been fairly busy. And he hasn't had time to, say, triage bug reports. Um, so we could, we could really use someone to work on this project. Uh, we had a Barrel maintainer who sort of flaked out on us. And Barrel has a lot of extra utilities that are really nice and should be load, um, worked into compies. Things like GUIs to configure it, and um, theme managers, and all sorts of really nice user level things that should be added onto compies. And, and we really want, we don't have these in the archive at all. We do have compies, but we don't have any of these Barrel apps, and we'd really like to get them. So, I know there's got to be someone out there who's interested in working on these. It, it, they're just window managers. They're in C. You can deal with them. Um, and they're really cool. You know, if, you're, if you're the Compies maintainer, you know, people will, will flock to you, and, and women will love you. Um, so please, please come talk to us. We'd really, I'd really like to get another maintainer working on these applications. Finally, um, this is also an unsolved problem, is that we have a lot of packaging infrastructure that we have built up from the past. Brandon Robinson wrote, uh, <laughs> an incredible amount of shell and, and make to, um, to handle packaging the, the X486 monolith. And we've carried over a lot of that into the, um, into the modular packages. And a lot of them aren't necessary anymore, but some of them it's pretty good, and we really want to keep it around for whatever reason. In addition, we've implemented a customized, improved uh, system to use the quilt patch system, which I hope all of you are using instead of dpatch. Um, because we wanted some extra targets, like a patch auditing target. Um, and we really want to push that out to the wider packaging audience. We want to allow everyone else to use that. And we don't want to be maintaining it anymore, really. So I don't know if some of that stuff, some of its shell scripts, I don't know if they should become um, dev helper applications and things like that. But that's something I'd really like to do. I'd, I'd like these to be fairly bare, um, simple packages to deal with, and MU to maintain. Um, and I'd like all these tools to be available for the wider, wider distribution without leaning on the X strike force to maintain them. So finally, I'd like to, to thank a bunch of people. I'd like to thank the rest of the X Strike Force. Um, there's only one member here, David, who's um, sitting, who's standing right there, passing around the mic. Um, you know, the rest of the team is incredible. I tried to credit everyone who, you know, everyone who's doing the bulk of the lifting lately. And I, I did not have time to credit all the um, people who maintain one driver or something like that. They're doing a fantastic job as well. Um, it's really a great team now. It's not just one person doing everything. I'm, I'm, I might be, I might be the best known of the team, but I don't necessarily feel like I'm doing a lot of the work. The team is fantastic, and they really deserve a ton of credit. Um, I'd like to thank the rest of x.org. Everyone upstream has been really great. Um, it's really a fantastic project. And to be honest, x.org really needs your help, too. Um, it's, it's, it's a hairy code base, admittedly, but you've got a great bunch of people working on it. It's being cleaned up. Um, and there's, there's, there's a great deal of good things to be done. I'd particularly like to thank Adam Jackson, who actually critiqued this talk before I, I gave it and really provided a lot of valuable input. 
Um, I want to thank FTP Master very quickly because during the module transition, they were very quick about getting to all our packages and getting them uploaded into the archive. And I know there was a lot of them. And I'd also like to thank all of you for actually getting up on time to see this talk. Um, I know that's a real struggle because I had to do it too. And, um, and for paying attention at all. So with that, I'd, I'd like to take whatever sort of questions there might be and, and discuss things. My name is Peter Reynoldsen from the Debian EDU project, and um, I was wondering what do I have to do to get uh, certain bugs fixed in X386? We have one three-year-old bug where we want to have uh, scripts running as root when the user log in to clean up the uh, environment for the next user. Uh, I've been talking to the X server team for the last two dev conferences on IRC and other things. Is there anything else? Can I buy a beer or anything? So you want to run? You want to run? You want to run scripts to clean up after after? Yeah, I want uh, a directory of fragments to be run by X reset. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. It was kind of echoey. I want X reset to run fragments from a directory like X startup. I, I honestly don't know. We should probably talk about that afterwards. Um, I really don't have an answer for you off the top of my head. Okay, we'll try that. I, um, I think you talked about this earlier, but I just probably missed it. Um, it's regarding the hardware database. How, how do you keep a collection of which video cards are supported and things like that? Because I see a lot of I see a lot of duplicate effort, effort there with I think the stuff you kind of mentioned before. Right. So the way it's done currently, the way the, the question was about. Um, um, the hardware database and the duplication of effort. So the way we do it currently is, in reality, there's, there's two major databases that are out there. There's Discover and Discover2, which are, which are essentially the same thing, and they're used by Debian. And um, I don't maintain that anymore. I'm still probably listed as a maintainer, but I don't work on that. Other people do. And they basically get, there's a centralized list of PCI IDs that are available, and, they, they map, and they've mapped them to, uh, to names of, of the hardware. And, uh, and then what we do is just manually update the thing. Say, okay, we know this driver supports this PCI ID, and we just add it in. Uh, there's also the Kudzu uh, database maintained by Red Hat, and I don't know how they update it. I assume it's essentially the same thing. And, and the Ubuntu hardware database, do you get anything from that? I don't use that. I don't think their scripts well, use. Does that Ubuntu anymore. use Discover or something else? They used to. I haven't looked at their. I haven't looked at their. Have you guys junked Discover finally? Yeah, they're still using Discover too. But I mean, really, the way to do this is to do it in the X server. I mean, all the drivers know what they support already. The question is telling the server which drive, what yeah, the drivers and, support. And so the X server has a database too or something? No, it currently does not. But doesn't uh, it need Well, it, it, it used it does. to. It doesn't, it doesn't, it used to, we used to centralize all the PCIDs, right? No. Okay. But, but essentially each driver knows what it supports. Um, if you look in the driver sources, They've got a list of, of PCIDs and things like that, so the drivers know what they support already. Oh, so there's no real, there's probably no real need then for a hardware database then. That's kind of the idea. Okay, that's that's, that's the ultimate idea. Going. The question is just how to get that information to the server so it loads the right driver, and that's what we need to do. Great, thanks. No problem. A comment on the uh, hardware detection thing. I'm the Discover to maintainer. Uh, I had a look at the X drivers, and uh, it's correct that the PCI mappings are in there, but we still need it to be able to pick the correct packet to install uh, if we want to avoid installing all the X driver packages when we are configuring X. Uh, it is possible with some um, defines and source magic to actually extract the PCI IDs from the source of the X drivers, and that would be interesting to feed that directly into Discover, but um, I haven't gotten around to actually do that. I just realized that it was possible because the source is actually structured fairly uh, consistently across drivers to detect the PCI IDs. Right. That's something we'd actually like to get working. Is We were talking about that uh, the other night at dinner, trying to figure out how to just install the drivers you need. Um, currently, we install all the drivers by default so that you don't have to worry about it. But obviously, that's not 
the most optimal way to do things in terms of disk space. Um, ideally, the server will know what driver it needs, and then it'll somehow tell the packaging structure how to get that, what, 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 what driver to download, and it'll just work. Um, I don't have a good method for doing that yet, but that's something I'd like to maybe get working. Maybe through Debian installer, I don't know. Um, I was just wondering um, what we're going to do about older monitors and that sort of thing where you can't get the resolution information. Is it going to come up in 640 by 480 or some sane default or what's going to happen? Yeah, it should have some sort of sane default. Um, basically, we can't do anything about those monitors anyway. Um, you know, the default install won't ask them about them, so people have to configure them anyway. So I think... Um, I think that people will just have to keep doing what they're doing, unfortunately. I mean, there's no real good solution. If the monitor is spitting out bad information to you or no information at all, you kind of just have to deal with it. Um, there is a mode for bad, so there are some monitors that actually lie to you. They actually just do not tell you the right um, information. And what Keith's implemented is a quirk system where it, it, it just, we're aware of these problems in the code of the X server and it just, automatically adjust things. So at least for bad monitors we can handle that. For old stuff I don't know if there's a good solution besides manual. Yeah, by default right now when we don't get EDID from the monitor we use um, refresh rate ranges that limit the available modes to 654, 8 by 6 and 10 by 7 at 60 hertz. So by default you get three modes at a relatively low refresh rate and monitors that don't support those are much older than the current X strike force so okay well before before I say goodbye I'd like to introduce Julian Christo who just walked in who's over there he's been maintaining a lot of your packages lately and he's been doing a fantastic job of it and I just wanted to thank him for that publicly as well since he missed that um, so if there's no other questions if you guys want to find me I'm around I'll be at hack labs and things and thank you all again for coming <laughs>